free and to the public um, over this uh, over the course of the uh, what is the academic year. We support archaeologists, educators, excavations, publications, research. Um, this is our area, and um, we try to bring these free public lectures to you and to societies across the United States and the world. Um, if you are interested in reading more about archaeology, we have two publications uh, which come out. Archaeology Magazine, which is available on newsstands and um, is a wonderful compendium of uh, recent archaeological information. This is published six times a year, comes out uh, every two months. And uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about digs across the world, it's a wonderful publication. Uh, we also offer electronically now the American Journal of Archaeology. Uh, this is a more scholarly publication, but for those of you who want a deep dive, um, I can recommend it. It is uh, certainly uh, a very, very old and very venerable um, type of uh, journal. Um, we have all kinds of experiences in archaeology. Happily, as COVID recedes behind us, we hope, as COVID recedes behind us, uh, opportunities to go into the field, opportunities to take trips uh, will open again. So um, you'll see at the bottom of the page, www.archaeological.org. That is the site of the AIA, the National AIA. And there you can find a lot of information about upcoming tours, programs, and so forth. In fact, for those of you who are looking for more archaeological online lectures, there are quite a few that are uh, linked to that site as well. We have a Facebook page, or I should say, I guess I have to change this. We have a meta page. Is that correct now? Uh, we, we do have a meta page and um, we hope that you will join us. You'll like us. We put up information about the upcoming lectures and um, other archaeological uh, adventures and events. Uh, this evening, we will be taking questions for our speaker at the end of the talk. So for those who have questions, uh, you can either, if you're online, enter them into the chat box at any time, and we will get to your questions according to the way in which they appear. Um, or if you're here, you can raise your hand. I know that this is something we haven't done for a while, but we will be taking uh, raised hands again uh, in order, to, uh, in order to, to be able to ask more questions of what I think is going to be a very interesting talk this evening. For those of you who are working on Zoom, um, perhaps you might or might not be aware that it does have closed captioning. This is located at the bottom of the page um, and we encourage you to use this uh, if you have not done it before. Um, just go to the CC caption at the bottom and you can change its size. Um, there's a setting for the subtitles. You can make them normal or medium or large, depending upon how you like to do this. Uh, Zoom is very user-friendly now, and uh, we hope that those of you at home um, will, use this, um, will use this feature if you need to. The Spokane AIA is beholden to a number of generous donors who have kept our series going. Um, we are all volunteers here at the AIA. Um, we take great pride in doing this. Uh, we have a wonderful board of people uh, who volunteer to do this. And we have um, a number of folks who have donated generously this year uh, to help us with our lectures. Um, and, and we're hoping to use uh, some of the money from this year as well next year. Next year will be our 75th anniversary, and we are hoping to put together a really wonderful slate of speakers. So I hope that you will keep this in mind starting in September, or uh, we will be having uh, some really excellent uh, talks. Um, but I am, again, very grateful, um, in particular to Carl and Suzanne Fleming, to George Halekas, to James Watts, and to, of course, Fred and Catherine Lauritsen. Um, in fact, uh, Fred and Catherine are sponsoring our final lecture of the year, and I draw your attention to the third Thursday of May. We usually don't go quite as late as May, but this year we will, in honor of Dr. Sarah Keller of Eastern Washington University. Um, and we'll be offering uh, a talk in her memory, uh, sponsored by the Lauritsons, um, a, a speaker who has been, not been here in a number of years, but has been to the AIA over the years, um, Dr. Gloria London, an independent scholar from Seattle, Washington. And she's going to speak about her work in Cyprus, wine jars and jar makers of Cyprus. Um, that'll be our final lecture of the year, and I hope you will join us for that. Um, and then we'll begin, of course, 
uh, probably in September um, with the 2022-23 lecture series. Uh, for those of you in our live audience, um, I hope that uh, if you have a cell phone, you could please uh, mute that. I haven't said that in a long time, uh, but uh, nonetheless, we hope that you will uh, will do this uh, so we can have a nice uninterrupted evening of live lectures. Yay! How do we feel about that? Let's hear it. Yay! Yay. Hear that, people at home? Yes, we do have a live audience here of about two dozen people. It's very nice. All right. Um, that said, um, I would very much like to introduce our speaker for this evening, um, and that is Dr. Stephen Nash. Um, he is the Director of Anthropology and Senior Cura Curator of Archaeology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, where he's worked for uh, nearly 15 years now. Um, between 1999 and 2006, he was previously the head of collections of the Department of Anthropology at the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, so he has worked at some of the premier institutions in our country. Um, he, uh, in the past, has been an adjunct assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado Denver and a research associate in the Laboratory of Tree Ring Research at the University of Arizona. Um, and according to his bio, um, he is also a columnist, a historian of science, and a stand-up comedian, which we talked about over dinner. Um, so hopefully we're going to have a, a very entertaining talk this evening. Uh, Dr. Nash received his PhD and MA in anthropology from the University of Arizona. Um, he's written and edited seven books and dozens of peer-reviewed articles on subjects ranging from Neanderthal stone tools to tree ring dates, the history of museums to Southwestern archeology. span um, He's published nearly 40 curiosities columns for the Sapiens online magazine. Um, so you can read more about his, uh, his thoughts and interests there on topics ranging from ancient Roman hygiene uh, to Leonardo da Vinci, uh, from the Huey helicopter to the use of GPS systems. Uh, so quite a ra wide range of things. Um, according to some of his online biography, he's currently studying the Mogollon archaeology of southwestern New Mexico, Indian peace medals in the museum's crane collection, and the enchanting Russian gem carving sculptures of Vasily Konovalenko. Um, tonight's lecture is something that he has published on recently as well and seems to have been a growing interest of his. He has lectured widely for the AIA on this subject. And so I'm very um, pleased to welcome Dr. Nash to speak this evening on why we repatriate 15 years on the arc of restorative justice at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So please welcome Dr. Stephen Nash. There we are. Very cool. Um, thank you all for being here tonight on Zoom. Thank you all for being there. I see some familiar, familiar names, Angela Neller and some other folks. Um, thanks so much for making time on a Thursday night. Um, you'll see up here on the title slide that I, that I changed the emphasis on the word to we repatriate, why we repatriate. This is a very personal journey, um, <clears throat> and it's in many ways specific to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in the last 15 years, but I'm going to make the case um, at the end of this presentation, that, that what we've done is things that I think many museums should do, and, it, it, and it's challenging all of the premises that we think museums are built on. Um, and it's exciting for, for debate purposes, for dialogue purposes. Ultimately, I think it's the right thing for us to do morally and ethically. But the we aspect of this, I need to start with a little bit of personal biography because history and context matters. And ultimately, science is performed by people and museum curators are people too. And many museums, for better or for worse, are excruciatingly influenced by the people who worked in them. Um, we'd like to think that it's systemic, 
um, research that leads to the collections that they're in. In some cases, that's true. It's also personal biases and interests. So my own biases and interests, as you heard from the bio uh, to start with, so thank you, Dr. Goldman. Um, life is too short to specialize, I think. So um, one of the joys of working in museums is being able to tackle lots of different fun and interesting subjects. So who is Steve Nash? What's his background? Where did he get going? Um, where he is not going is with the clicker. This clicker is not working. All right. Um, hold on just a second. It was working and it should be working. Yes. Hold on. It's not. So sorry. It's all right. This is the only technical snafu that we have. We can do that. So, so I, I flipped that one. That's right. I will, I will do it otherwise. Thank you. All right, my background. So Denver Museum of Nature and Science, I'm there now. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So the three parts of the talk, people remember in threes. We'll talk about my background so you know where I'm coming from. We'll talk about what's happened at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in the last 15 years and its history and why it matters, why it's possible in Denver. Um, and then we'll dive into some case studies here. So I thought that everybody grows up within a stone's throw of a major museum, a world-class museum. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, um, a stone's throw from the Museum of Science and Industry. If you all have been there, um, I worked there for eight years from while I was in high school and college, and I thought everybody had access to such places like this. But the Museum of Science and Industry is a very peculiar place. I didn't realize that it had collections until after I moved back to Chicago to work at the Field Museum. It was a museum of advertising. I had to memorize the corporate sponsors of 50 different exhibitions to pass my exam to start working there. What a bizarre notion, but that's America, right? Folks, we're talking about corporations, corporate sponsorship. Museum of Science and Industry got its start in the 1933 Columbian Exposition. Was it an anthropology? Is it anthropology? Well, it was a history of technology, a history of progress, quote unquote, in the Americas, right? It's the, 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 the century of progress was to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of the city of Chicago, but it was talking about technological progress in the Americas. And that's a very agenda-driven institution. Uh, one could look at it and say, eh, maybe it's anthropology. I like to look back and say that it was some sort of anthropology, at least for me, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's a museum of science and industry, tech, anthropology, maybe. But one of the things that was interesting that happened while I was there was the 19, it was the 1980s. I started in 80 and something fascinating happened in 1982. And that is that IBM, International Business Machine, the computer company sponsored Mathematica for decades. Now the Mathematica exhibit was this extraordinary exhibit, you see it on the lower right there, that had the old dead white guys, Leibniz and all these people who, who designed calculus and things like that presented there. It also had a Mobius strip, you know, the strip that has a train running on it. And it's a one surface piece of paper. And it had mathematical concepts presented in three dimensions so that people could go in and it was actually a truly interactive exhibition. And it's wonderful. And they took it out in 1982. And I was devastated. Didn't know it then. I know it now. It's at the Boston Museum of Science. So if you go to Boston, you can see this Mathematica exhibit, go in and check it out and compare it to every other exhibition that you're seeing now. Because what happened in 1982 is that IBM replaced it with a history of the computer. There wasn't a whole lot of history of the computer in 1982, but they had an agenda. They were, it was their advertising. So they wanted people to, to understand the history of the personal computer. And what was the problem with that? The problem with that was it turned this wonderful 3D interactive exhibition into a two-dimensional thing in which one person is watching a video screen and everybody else is watching that person watch the video screen. Even today, we know it's no fun to watch somebody else on the computer. And it changed exhibitions as we knew them. And I never forgot that. 2007, what's the other point of inflection here? We were talking about it at dinner, folks. The iPhone came out 15 years ago this June. That's when the internet goes mobile. That's a point of inflection. It changes exhibitions. It's changing our interaction with technology and so on. We're still not done figuring out what that means. But I keep those two dates in mind because that's when American society, modern society across the world really changed in museums. And what museums still haven't come to terms with is virtual reality and artificial intelligence and big data. And I'm not gonna talk about that anymore. Um, but this was a formative experience in my life is watching how technology changes in museums. The Field Museum in Chicago. Got its start in 1893 from a World's Fair. Again, a World's Fair. 
This is designed to show the prowess, the, the progress, the superiority of American society. Ignore the fact that it's a year late for Columbus, Columbus stumbling on America. It should have been uh, 1892, but it was 1893, who's counting? But Frederick Ward Putnam sent missionaries and scholars and people all over the world to collect stuff and bring it back to Chicago. Because and that was the only way that most people had to learn about the rest of the world. Did it other, other populations? You bet it did. But it was the only way that people had to learn about other folks because most couldn't travel. Most, they didn't have access to the internet and all that kind of stuff. So it served a purpose. Did it do harm? Yes, it did harm, but it served a purpose. It was a founding moment for the discipline of anthropology. Field Museum had friends Boaz on its staff for one year. And then a contract dispute gets him to leave and go to Columbia and the American Museum. Yeah, Chicago, you sort of messed up. Um, anyway, it's got a glorious history, and yet it's also got um, an ignominious history. We've got to be careful about that. How about the Denver Museum of Nature and Science? Interestingly, founded also as part of the City Beautiful movement. The Denver City planners went to Chicago and saw the City Beautiful movement implemented, big wide boulevards, parks, and so on. They came back to Denver and put in big wide boulevards and parks and put the museum in the park. If, if you've been to Denver, you know that there's two grids. There's one street grid downtown, which runs parallel and perpendicular to the Platte River. And then all of a sudden, it goes north, south, east, west. That is in 1900, when they come back and implement City Beautiful. Great, fantastic. But that's where we got our start. The building, um, our little Greco-Roman temple to knowledge there is, was built in 1908. It's now subsumed by what our CEO calls the prison. I guess we look like a prison. Um, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But our Greco-Roman te temple to knowledge is all buried in that thing. We've had 10 major expansions over the last uh, 100 years. So we're more like, architecturally, more like the American Museum in New York with a whole series of expansions than we are the Field Museum, which got one giant building and now can't modify the outside of it. Anyway, we get 2 million visitors a year, folks, more than the Field Museum, way more. We're on par, we're not quite the Smithsonian, but we get 2 million visitors a year, that's fantastic. We have 450 employees right now, 1,800 volunteers. It's astonishing numbers, incredibly dedicated folks. And yet, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is not without flaws. Um, and we've been working proactively to try and address some of these things as we go forth. Interestingly enough, the museum didn't have a Department of Anthropology for the first three decades of its existence. And in 1935, we did something interesting. We hired Hannah Marie Wormington as a bachelor's degree holding anthropologist, archeologist from the University of Denver. And for the next 33 years, she was the Department of Archeology, span popularizing the discipline. Hmm, interesting, right? She wasn't taken seriously by the male establishment. She was taken seriously. She was not, um, she ultimately got her PhD in 1952-ish um, but she was, she was always on the outside looking in. So she carved a niche for herself and did it by popularizing archaeology and so on. But in 1968, we acquired, acquired the first ethnographic collection for the museum, and it was the product of Mary and Frances Crane, two um, Northeastern blue bloods who were very, very rich and believed in service to society. They started collecting Native American material culture in 1951 and for 17 years went bonkers. They were buying up entire small museums and collections and individual pieces from all over the country. Started a museum on Marathon Key, Florida. How many of you have ever been to Marathon Key, Florida? Yep. And if you did go, did you go there for the museums? <laughs> yeah, no. So they gave their entire collection to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. That is the same year that Marie Wormington talked herself out of a job. She, she uh, got fired in, in, uh, in, um, in 1968. So the modern era, the modern three curators, at least until two years ago, was me on the right, Dr. Michelle Coons in the center, and Dr. Chip Colwell on the left. Chip left to become editor-in-chief of Sapiens two years ago, still a good friend, uh, but he's the thought leader in much of the work that I'm going to talk about today, um, and he's published extensively on repatriation, and I can help you get in touch with him, but he left um, two years ago, um, and so there goes Chip. So it's just me and Michelle. We're, we're searching for another curator right now. All good. Um, and then as, as, uh, as Dr. Goldman mentioned, I do stand-up comedy on the side because humans are absurd creatures. Um, and if we can't laugh during the difficult topics that we have to deal with, what good are we? I'm not going to dive into this anymore, but if you want to know more about science, riot, and stand-up comedy and all that, I'm happy to chat. All right. Take a break here. Take a breath. Anybody got any idea what that is? Museum quiz time? Fossil fish from where? Wyoming. Very good. Green, Green River formation. How old, roughly? 
Uh, how old? Oh, it's Eocene. Eocene, 55 million years? Is that Eocene? I don't even know. Yeah. What happened to that fish? <laughs> see? Yeah, see? There you go. What happened to the fossil? Fish went kaboom. Fish apparently sometimes they'll decay and accumulate all this gas and then explode. And this one did it and it got fossilized. And I just had to put that in here because it's a nice break. All right. Modern area DMNS starts in 2006, um, and, and I had come from the Field Museum, undeniably a world-class collection, right? Colonial as heck, um, go out, collect everything, bring it back to Chicago, all that, right? Fantastic collection. I mean, it is unbelievable to see what's behind the scenes, and yet I spent nine years there trying to catalog and curate collections that had been on the shelves for decades, folks, decades, not cataloged, seven decades in some cases, more than that. Our major museums are full of collections. Even our minor museums are full of collections that are not cataloged. How dare we lecture private collectors about their collections when our own houses aren't in order? So when I got to Denver, I said, we, not, we need to do something a little bit different here. We need to create an aspiration statement. And so what we did is, and for me, my contribution was, we seek to curate the best understood collection in North America. And Chip said, that's good. That's not good enough. It's gotta be the most ethically held collection in North America. Now I can hear your wheels churning and you're saying that's unattainable, number one. How do you measure it, number two? And most ethical can't really be measured. Doesn't matter. It was an aspiration statement. It was to guide our work going forward. This is what we want to be. <clears throat> Doesn't need to be measurable necessarily, but this has guided our efforts over the last few years. And what we decided to do was to get out of the human remains business. And I hate to sound crass about that because we're sensitive about it, but with the museum had a chance, we had ancestors, primarily Native American ancestors in the collections. And we said, enough, we're not gonna be in the business of curating human remains in the absence of informed consent. Now, having come from the Field Museum, I said to Chip, you know what? It's a good thing we're not at the Field Museum because uh, this project is too big for them. And he said, why do you say that? And I said, 12,000 Native American ancestors there is too big, where do you start? And he said, that's a cop-out. And he was right, but so was I. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science had 120 ancestors in the collections. It was a tractable, it was, a, it was a, an addressable issue, an addressable problem. And for a major natural history museum to tackle that issue and make a stand on this was something that we could do and decided to do. So, you know, we, we set out to do that. Now other museums are starting to join the fray, but here we are three decades after the passage of NAGPRA and something like 40% of the ancestors in collections have been repatriated. It's an astonishingly low number after three decades, folks. So we decided to get out of the business and we did. We decided that our repatriation philosophy was not gonna be grounded in, in the law. The law sets a, sets a bar, a low bar, right? We wanted to do ethical bars, moral bars. So we decided that repatriation is not a property rights issue, it's a human rights issue. That shouldn't be an astonishing statement. Um, we wanted all of our work to proceed with the principles of justice, diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. Those buzzwords get a lot of play right now. We said it back in the day, but this is why we were talking about restorative justice. We wanted to try and help right some of the wrongs, some of the wrongs that museums have perpetrated over the years. So going back to a little bit of legal primer, for those of you who don't know or don't remember, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was passed November 16th of 1990. 32 years ago, it's hard to believe folks. It's the legal process by which lineal descendants, you can read this. It's a legal process, that's it. The axial concept in it is cultural affiliation. How do you identify cultural affiliation, determine cultural affiliation? First of all, please note that it was the museum's purview, the institution's purview not the descendant community's purview to determine cultural affiliation. Yes, there are 10 lines of evidence used to determine cultural affiliation, but our archeological colleagues mostly didn't use those 10 lines of evidence. They used the lines of evidence that were most familiar to them. It's not a surprise, anthropologically, it's not a surprise, um, but it's one of the shortcomings in the law. Um, again, NAGPRA is federal law, it's Indian law, it's property law, it's human rights legislation, it's all of that kind of stuff but it's a low bar, it's the, it's, the, the, you know, it's, it's the easiest bar to achieve in many ways because you can hide behind the law. But let's look at the context, folks. Anybody here remember 1990? Some of you don't, most of you do. 
1990 was a crazy year, folks. The U.S. invaded Panama and blasted guns and roses at Manuel Noriega. But that was the status of warfare back then. The U.S. Army surrounded the man's house and used loudspeakers to blast guns and roses tunes at Manuel Noriega to get him to surrender. I don't remember if it worked, but I remember it happening. The, the first McDonald's opened in Moscow. Tragically, that McDonald's just closed down because of the war in Ukraine. Germany reunified. The, the first Gulf War happened. First web page was published. Holy smokes. Stephen King's first it, that god awful, terrible movie, came out. Um, the Dow for you stock market investors was at 3,000. Gas was a buck 14 a gallon, which is actually um, not that much different than it is now when adjusted for inflation. Stamps, 25 cents, and so on. Anyway, 1990 was a long time ago. To review, NAGPRA provides a legal framework by which lineal descendants and federally recognized tribal nations can make claims. They don't make determinations. They don't get to decide what gets repatriated. They can make a claim for repatriation that the institution then evaluates. They can make claims on their ancestors, on funerary objects, the stuff that they're buried with, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony, which is the one that nobody ever knows what it is, right? It's, a, it's an object that belongs to everybody, and therefore no one has the ability to, to dispose of that object. Think of like the Liberty Bell. Yeah, it belongs to the Park Service, but it sort of belongs to every American. That's the example that we use. So four classes of material culture. NAGPRA, the law, does not mandate reburial. And our archaeological colleagues in the AIA, the SAA, and elsewhere were shrill back in the 80s against the repatriation movement because all those, those objects and specimens, their terms, are going to get reburied and it's going to kill archaeology as we know it. Didn't happen. Uh, it was a partially funded mandate. It was unfunded for many, many years. It's a partially funded mandate uh, because National Park Service does give out some grants now. Um, and there were unintended consequences of NAGPRA. You'll hear people talking about relationships that are developed. Yes, that's great. We should have had those relationships prior to NAGPRA. We shouldn't have had a law force those relationships on people. But most interesting for me, for a lot of uh, Native American tribal nations, is that they had to come up with new religious ceremonies, frankly, new cosmologies, because some of the most um, powerful, impactful, negative things they can do is come into contact with their ancestors after they've been passed on to the next world. And museums certainly weren't about passing them on to the next world. So these, these tribal nations have had to create new ceremonies to accept their own ancestors back into their own cultural sphere. That was not addressed in the law. Propatriation is another thing. One way that, that museums, um, you know, it's not about cost benefit analysis and not about giving something back necessarily to the museum, but something that museums have started doing is, is requesting that objects um, be created, pieces of art be created, and then have those go back to the museum to honor the transaction and so on. And the term for that that people use is propatriation. It's not really out there too much, uh, but the concept is being bandied about in a lot of different places. Is science under threat? I would argue no. And as I'll argue in a little bit, I think there's a statute of limitations on science. And, and I can see some of you being like, what the heck is he talking about? And we'll get to that in a little bit. So Denver Museum of Nature and Science. When I got there in 2006, we were not in compliance with NAGPRA. Somebody had filed a federal uh, complaint against us and with the Department of the Interior. So in 2008, we decided to change our policies. We wanted repatriation. Our decisions, remember the decisions are to be made, are based in the institution, not in the tribal nations. We wanted most of our decisions to be based on source community standards. Not legal standards, not scientific ones, source community standards. Um, what about sacred object repatriation? Our philosophy was just do it. Who are we to judge what's sacred and not sacred? And I'm not religious, but I challenge any of you who are, go into a church, or even if you're not, Go into a church, a mosque, a synagogue, any kind of religious establishment, and do something with material culture there that you're not supposed to do, and watch how quickly people freak out. Go chug a beer out of a chalice. And that's exactly the metaphor for what's happened in museums, is you end up with material culture being totally out of context. Who are we to say what's sacred and what's not sacred? Our museums are full of sacred objects. In the end, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science repatriated 96 ancestors, uh, Native American ancestors, and then repatriated 312 associated funerary objects. On a percentage basis, that's nothing out of the collection. On a moral and ethical basis, that's a huge number because it was the right thing to do. 
Think about if your loved ones were in a museum or in a repository somewhere without your permission and think about what you would wanna have happen. Uh, our repatriation work is still ongoing. We, we just acquired a big collection. We don't dig much. I think it's unethical to dig actually, given the amount of stuff that's in museums. You destroy a site when you dig it, let's take care of what's in our museums first. But there was a big collection in Texas from New Mexico where I do work. Uh, and so we acquired it and we took the ancestors have already been repatriated and reburied before it ever, they ever came. They never came to Denver. We took care of that before the collection came. All right, that's my next breather slide. Any thoughts, comments, questions very quickly about that NAG for a recap and so on? We can also do questions after. That, by the way, is a, is a Yoruba Abeji, a twin statue um, from Nigeria. Just an exquisite piece of art and compelling and thoughtful and all of that. And that's just my reminder to take a chill for a second. All right. We also at the Denver, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just wondering if uh, a relative had to ask you for their relatives, mm -hmm. if so they even know that they're there. Yeah, yeah, so the question for those of you on, on Zoom who couldn't hear that, um, if a relative, if an individual comes in, if it's a known individual, a relative has to know that that person is there. Yeah, it's a clause in NAGPRA that doesn't get used very much. Lineal descendants don't know the lineal, you know, their lineal ancestors. So oftentimes it's done on the, on the, on the tribal nation level. There are instances in which individuals have ended up in museums and then descendants have made those appeals. It's not as common. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we also decided to um, re repatriate um, non-native human remains. NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, only governs Native American ancestors that are in the collections. Most museums in the Natural History Museum, certainly in, in the United States and North America, and even in Europe are full of indigenous populations, not the local, not the Euro-American people who run the museums. Um, so we decided to make a stand and to, to repatriate, uh, and to rebury 20 or so folks whose remains were in the museum. And I want you to think about how these folks ended up in the museum. They didn't end up through informed consent. They didn't say, I wanna donate my body to science. We had a foot, we had a desiccated foot that was cataloged in the collections and somebody had bought it at a yard sale and then given it to the museum. So think about the chain of events that has to happen. Somebody finds a desiccated foot out on the landscape. It happens in Colorado in an arid environment. They pick up that foot, they take it home and say, hi honey, look what I found out in the ranch today. Um, and then, well, you can keep that in that garage, honey, but don't that bring that in the house, right? And then they have a yard sale. They decide to sell this foot. Somebody decides to buy it. Somebody brings it to the museum and says to the curator, hey, do you want a desiccated foot? And the curator says, heck yes, we need a desiccated foot in the collection. And I said, why would we keep that? And a paleontologist friend of mine said, well, it has data. And I said, what do you mean, Richard? It has data. And he said, well, it came from planet Earth. He's not wrong, but it's not right either. Right? That thing had no research potential. It had symbolic potential. And we had an articulated skeleton. Again, note, note to self, it was purchased by a doctor in Paris on his honeymoon. He goes out and he said, oh, look at that articulated skeleton. Honey, I'm gonna buy an articulated skeleton. Took it back to his shop and put it up in Denver. It wasn't even the right individual. If you believe that you can differentiate the races that don't exist, but populations, yeah, it was three different, you know, it was, it was people from all over the world cobbled together for an articulated skeleton. It wasn't even scientifically accurate. We had some donated skulls and so on. Anyway, what do you do with people who end up in a museum, no research value with them, not that that's our primary thing, but what do you do with them? What should you do with them? And, and just putting your head in the sand, which is what a lot of people do, hence the ostrich, um, is not appropriate either. You can't just say, well, we don't know what we're going to do with them, so you keep them. So what did we do? Folks, we held the bad bar joke conference. We got a rabbi, a priest, an imam, an agnostic, an atheist, a physical anthropologist, an archaeologist, an attorney, and some jamoke off the street and gave them lunch and said, hey, what should we do with these 20 people who ended up on our shelves with no informed consent? And we deliberated for a day and the physical anthropologist said, digitize them. And, and, then, and, then, and then you can at least analyze them later and students can learn from them. She's not wrong. But she wasn't right either, because guess what, folks? It costs way more money to curate digital specimens than it costs to curate the bones themselves. If you want to do that, just keep them on the shelf. That's cheap. And ultimately, we decided to rebury them in non-denominational burial plot in Crestone, Colorado, non-denominational ceremony in a natural burial plot in Crestone, Colorado. What does natural burial plot mean? It means no boxes and no chemicals. And it is beautiful. And there it is. We did. We held the ceremony up there. The, the guy in the white hat on the left 
is the only person in North America who is certified to do a platform cremation like they do in, in, um, in East Asia. So if you want a platform cremation done, go to Crestone, Colorado. And it was a beautiful thing. And then guess what, folks? The next day, we reburied Native American ancestors there because one of the tragic con unintended consequences of NAGPRA is that it didn't provide any space to rebury ancestors. And the federal government, in its infinite wisdom, won't allow you to rebury ancestors in, on its property unless you can prove that they came from that property. So if something came from Mesa Verde, you can rebury there. But if you don't know that, it, you know, if you don't know where it came from. So guess what? We talked to the tribal nations and said, hey, we think we found a space. And now the Crestone Cemetery, all 4,000 acres of it is being used to rebury ancestors in a legally protected cemetery in Colorado. My wife doesn't like it, but that's where I'm going. <laughs> Vigongo, African grave posts. Ah, 1980s, a Los Angeles art dealer that needs something to, uh, African art dealer needs something to jazz up the market. Sales aren't going so well. Um, these are grave posts, um, ancestral posts carved by the Mijikenda tribes of Kenya. They're not only grave markers, but these are considered to be the physical embodiment of the dead person's soul. We did not want to be in the business of curating souls. So we decided to repatriate and uh, return these folks to Kenya, these posts. They were, um, our collection came to us from Gene Hackman, the movie actor. You know, he, he has no connection to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And, and yet they, they offer us 30 of these things. We're like, oh, cool, thanks, Gene. Um, and he gets a tax deduction. And we got pieces that were never on display and were in the collections for 30 years, right? Um, these are two Vigongo that got repatriated in the late 90s and early aughts. Um, that were found at the Illinois State Museum and got sent back, and they're now in a cage um, in, in the Mijikenda so they won't get stolen again. Um, but I've been working on this project for a while. In 2014, we had the mayor and our city councilman on the left, CEO in the middle, Kenyan ambassador, and um, some dignitaries from the city and county of Nairobi come over, and we signed repatriation papers um, and had a story in the New York Times about this. How cool is this? We're going to repatriate ancestral souls to the Kenyans. And we packed them up, shipped them out to Denver International Airport. They cleared customs. And then the Kenyan Revenue Authority told us that they wanted a $40,000 import tariff. I'm from Chicago, folks. I understand bribery and extortion. But let's be reasonable, okay? 2,000 bucks, $5,000 I could have justified. $40,000, sorry. So they sat in, uh, at Denver International Airport for a couple of years. And then in 2018, I just happened to go to the Getty Leadership Institute Business School for Museum Leaders. And in my class was Dr. Purity Kira from the National Museums of Kenya. And I was that weird guy that at the opening reception, I went running up to her and I was like, Dr. Kira, we got to solve this. We got to take care of this. And we became accountability partners and so on. And she went back home and she got the Kenyan Revenue Authority to give us a letter, said, we're not going to charge you anything um, when these things come back. And then we also did something on the crates. We changed the value from $40,000 to zero. They have no financial value, which is baloney. The crates alone had financial value, but if that's what it takes, that's what we did. And we got them repatriated. And in 2019, I took my family over there to meet with these people to not apologize to them. That wasn't really the, 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 the task there, but to break bread with them and yeah, do a, a, a fun little staged photograph. They walked me and my family through two miles of jungle and the sweltering heat and all this to get to the village. And then all of a sudden they appeared with this Vigongo and I realized the truck was right there. <laughs> they just didn't give us a ride. They made us walk. And, and guess what? It worked. It was, it was beautiful. The smiles in that scene are sincere. The guy on the left with the sunglasses on his shirt is Dr. Jimby Katana, who's a Midji kind of tribal member and a professional anthropologist and a guy with whom we're still working. So we sent those folks home. And then I was there last fall in September. Those are those two Vigongo in the cage. And that's Festus Mwangu, who still is um, taking pride of place with his ancestors. He doesn't care that they're in a cage. He cares that they're back home. So I'm working with um, the Mijikenda tribes still to this day to try and get a center put up where Vigongo can be re-erected and, and a secure center so that they don't get stolen again. But Vigongo are like totem poles. They're supposed to decay on the landscape, right? So this thing is going to be outside, hopefully, at, at Melindy National Monument, which is federally protected land. And I was in a, a guy's shop. He had 50 of these things sitting in his garage. 
Um, they were they were looted from all over the place. The Minji Kendo claim that that it has really screwed up their economy and their social systems and all that kind of stuff. Again, who am I to judge? I'm going to do what I can to keep getting the Vagongo back. Um, how about all those people who are afraid that the tribal nations are going to request things back and empty out museums? This is the Many Hands shirt at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Stella Ironcloud is there on the left. Her grandfather's hands were used as a stencil for this shirt when he was five years old. And she called me up and heard that, 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 that this piece was at the museum. And she came into my office and her knees buckled when she saw it. And did she demand return? She said, no. She and her, and her family members looked at it and she's like, my goodness, this thing is in such good shape. Um, fantastic. It's, thank you for taking such good care of it. Um, so this is not about a zero sum game in which one group benefits and one group loses. Certainly not museums lose, losing. And then most recently, folks, we got a $25 million gift. That is not a typo. A $25 million gift to create the Avenir Conservation Center. Um, it's for inclusive conservation. So what we're going to be doing is working with source communities around the world to help preserve objects on their terms. So this is um, Marlo Brion and uh, Raven LeBlanc um, from Northwest Coast coming down to look at um, some, of the, some of the pieces from their tribal nations and others that were on exhibit. Um, uh, Raven is coming back next week to continue this work, and we're going to be doing this uh, in perpetuity. Because guess what, folks? Museums are really good at preserving. We can preserve the heck out of stuff, but we need to be inclusive about that. And we've got too much stuff in our museums. So inclusive conservation means working with source communities outside of the museum. Octavius Seotua there on the left, he's a Zuni uh, cultural expert with whom we've been um, working on archaeology in New Mexico. Pena Market murals down there on the right. Uh, we're going to be exposing murals this summer um, down in Peru and preserving those with Peruvian conservators on their terms. Um, and we'll continue that work going forward. That's Dr. Michelle's, Michelle Coons' work um, that we're going to be doing. We're also going to be doing some work with the Cairo Museum and other kinds of projects. Um, it's an unbelievable turn of events, quite frankly. Um, we couldn't see that coming. Remind me to take a breath. Anybody here been to the Grand Canyon? On, have you been to, on rafting through the can, Grand Canyon? Uh, if you, there are places to see this, but uh, you can definitely see it if you go rafting through it. That line down there, sort of two thirds of the way down, is the Great Unconformity. There's a billion years of time missing from that sequence, folks. <laughs> it's a billion years. We ain't worth a hill of beans, right? Our iPhones come out 15 years ago, and there's a billion years of Earth's time missing in that sequence, and we know it. It's unbelievable. It's the joy of working in a natural history museum because you get this from your colleagues. All right, what are, the, what are the things I want you to walk away from, from this? Is the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is great that I'm great? No. I want you to challenge all of our premises about museums. I want us to challenge them. I don't want us to throw them out. I want us to question them. What is an encyclop encyclopedic museum and why does it exist? Encyclopedic museums are largely a Euro, European, European American Western civilization phenomenon, but they existed at a time, they were created at a time when the only way to learn about the rest of the world was via libraries and museums, right? There was no internet, there certainly weren't any iPhones. You went to libraries and museums. Our mission statement at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science for years, bringing the world to Denver, because the world couldn't, because Denver couldn't afford to go out to the world. Did it lead to some othering? You bet it did. Was it a bad thing? Nope. Harm was done, good things were done. But I don't think that we need encyclopedic museums in the 21st century. We're a global society. We can see things, wonderful things, from our living room chairs. What we need to do is be more tactical, more smart, more ethical about what we're doing with museums. Curate in perpetuity. Sure, that's what we all say. What does perpetuity mean? Forever. All right. Thank you. What is, uh, let's put a number. How long is perpetuity? The Peabody Museum of, of uh, Anthropology and Archaeology at Harvard University put a number on perpetuity, 300. All right, cool. We're going to guarantee that this stuff is going to be around for 300 years. Guess what, folks? There are museums out there that have backlogs of collections that if they stopped collecting today, and they're not going to stop, but if they stop collecting today, they don't finish their backlog of their priority, priority items for 70 years. That doesn't even get them to their non-priority items. That, to me, is unconscionable. Should there be a statute of limitations on human remains study? Now, I can hear you all thinking, and you should be thinking this. Museums curate 
material because new scientific techniques are going to come along at some point in the future. Absolutely true. DNA analysis is the great one, the exception that proves the rule, right? But museums that I have worked in have had human remains, uncatalogued human remains, cat, uh, sitting on shelves for seven decades, for 100 years, 150 years. When is enough enough? How many of you, well, one of the questions that I, that I love to ask physical anthropologists, biological anthropologists, because it makes them really uncomfortable. Have you donated your body to science? And they'll oftentimes say, well, yeah, I'm, I, my driver's license says that I'm, a, I'm an organ donor. It's not the same thing, because that's your catastrophe becoming somebody, somebody other's benefit. I ask again, have you donated your body to science? And if you haven't, then how can you study the human remains that are in museums in the absence of informed consent? Because I argue science, yes, we can do science on, on human remains. We can learn a tremendous amount from human remains. Then let's curate everybody. But it is not cool for museums to curate 95% of the uh, 90, 95% of the human remains collections are Native American or indigenous, and then the white people all go to the cemeteries. No longer acceptable. I'm not sure that it ever was acceptable. It is certainly no longer acceptable today. So again, curate everyone and curate nobody. Have you donated your body to science? Anyway, I say all of these things because I also believe what Ruth Benedict wrote in 1937, you all can read. 1937, folks, it doesn't feel so different. And all I can say to that is, dang straight, purpose of this stuff is to make the world safe for human differences. And we can do that and museums should be involved. So if you ever have time, proclivity, if you're in Denver, come by, see us. Um, I'd be happy to show you around. If you're interested in learning more about this crazy journey that we've been on, um, Chip and I have published four different places on this kind of thing. I can send around those links and so on and so forth. Um, but thank you for your time and attention. I am done talking. Did I provoke you enough? <laughs> uh, and if not, what, what, what questions might you have? Yeah, the Spalding collection. This is an artifact repatriated to the Nez Pierce tribe mm -hmm. that were shipped from the Nez Pierce by the Spalding mission mm -hmm. to fund, fund their mission. And they asked for Mac. Mm -hmm. and they, said they were shipped to Ohio, and they were at the Ohio Historic Society. Mm -hmm. And they said, "Sure, we'll ship them back, but you're going to pay for them." Mm -hmm. Is that ethical? Um, so the question for those of you on Zoom who may not have heard the question, it's about the Spalding Collection. I don't know all the details. Ohio Historical Society, Nez Perce. Um, museums are broke. Museums don't have any money. Um, and one of the things that technology, the, the unintended consequences of technology, is that museums can't, um, there's not a, a critical mass of museums to really pay for the database development and other kinds of things that we need to really get up to snuff. So I can pick up my phone right now and buy a plane ticket from Lima to Johannesburg, but I can't look up a database of museum objects in two different museums that are right down the street from each other. That's not gonna be solved immediately. That's not what you're asking about, but technology becomes more and more um, uh, of, a, of a priority for museums because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Moore's law and planned obsolescence on these exhibits. So museums have to keep investing in exhibits to keep up with current trends, yada, yada, yada. Museums don't have a lot of money. Is it ethical for somebody to ask for somebody to ship? Yeah, I think it is actually, because the, the home institution has benefited from those collections being in their, in their possession for a long time. The other thing I would argue, and I'm not saying that museums should do this, but there's disposable income all over the United States and the Western world, and we can ask. And it's oftentimes not prohibitively large amounts of money to ship those collections back. It wasn't just for um, yeah, so if it wasn't just for shipping ethics, some people might think that's ethical. I think it's less ethical. Um, uh, everything is negotiable. You know, I drew the line with the Kenyans. It's like import tariff, be reasonable. So, uh, the Nespers paid mm -hmm. and they were shipped. And then there was a big public outcry in the Ohio Historic Society's tore up the check. Oh my God. I don't know anything about that case, so I shouldn't say anything more. Um, these issues can bring out the worst in people. It is true, um, and or the best, or the best. And one of the things that that I made the case to the, to our donor with the Abner Conservation Center is one of the things that we may do with this center is help pay for the return of objects. So there's at least three Vigongo at the Kenyan consulate. They don't have the money to ship them back. 
it's conceivable that we would use some of the money from our conservation center to ship those Vigongo back to Kenya. It's conceivable. I'm not going to say we're going to do it. It's conceivable. But these are complicated issues, and money is a severe limitation on all fronts. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, talk about a number of issues with NAGPRA? You know, what's uh, going on to why? Yeah. Um, so the, the question was, um, there, there are some problems with NAGPRA as it was written. There were some revisions done to it about 12 years ago for the culturally unaffiliated um, ancestors. So there's cultural affiliation. Again, that gets determined by the museum or the institution. Then there's this whole category of culturally unaffiliated folk and how do you deal with them? We took care of the culturally unaffiliated folks in Denver ahead of the curve by simply going by geography and contacting regional tribes. At one point, we sent out notices to all 565 at the time, federally recognized tribes to say, please help us. We got responses from about 20 of them. There are revisions, but federal law is really hard to revise. Um, I don't know of anything that's happening right now. It's probably at the code level and not the, the law level, um, uh, but I'm blissfully unaware of the intricate details on the law because we've, again, we went from morals and ethics. Hmm. Uh, we have a, a question from, uh, I'm going to myself, a question from the chat box. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a question in the chat box is, um, what happened at museums like Moundville, Alabama, where a lot of tribes claim to have common ancestry there, but it can't be proven other than through cultural similarities and oral history? I know it was up for debate for a while, but where do they draw the line on what is acceptable evidence to claim their ancestors' remains? Uh, I don't know the specifics on, on the Moundville, Alabama case. I can say that it's very, very complicated. And get 500 representatives, 565 groups of any kind, and see if you can get agreement um, on them. These are very, very, very difficult issues. Um, but again, one of the reasons why we at, at the museum decided to, to engage repatriations on the basis of source community standards was so that we took a step back from the discussion. Um, we did a... Um, with the WS Ranch ancestors, that archeological collection that I showed you that was all wrapped up, there was about 54 ancestors represented in that collection. Um, and we got, we sent um, notices out to, I think 24 Puebloan tribes in the American Southwest and said, folks, we're gonna have a discussion in Albuquerque. Please come and join us in this discussion if you're interested. If not, you know, we'll let you know who is, who is deciding to take the lead. And at the end, about six tribes showed up and it was ultimately the Zuni and the Acoma that decided that, that they, they, you know, we just, we did cultural affiliation for all 24 tribes and they decided that they weren't gonna argue about it and quibble about it, that the most important thing was to get the ancestors back into mother earth. And we did that. Now, is that unusual? I can't say, um, but that would be my hope is that in, in contentious issues at Monville and elsewhere that, that, that people would be able to come together and come to some agreement about what's the best thing to do. But this is the, the it is such a complicated system and there's a NAGPRA review board at the federal level and so on and so forth. And it's fraught and it's difficult. And it's one of the other reasons why I'm happy to do that we did what we chose to do in Denver because we could. Uh, and that's why I was right when I said to Chip, this would have been harder at the Field Museum with 12,000 sets. There's just orders of magnitude difference and things get more complicated when there's appraised value on objects, when there's, you know, all of these complicating issues. I saw a hand go up over here. Um, so when you mentioned that the burial site that you guys have now, um, who is protecting them? Or who is that under and how is that land? So the, the land, it's run by the town of Crestone. And Crestone is a fascinating town because there's like 150 citizens of uh, denizens of Crestone and there's 300 organized religions. I mean, it's really, it's really, it's, it's one of these nexus spots in the San Luis Valley. Um, and it's one of the challenges and one of the problems with archaeology as it's been practiced in, in North America is that cemeteries defined under European tradition with headstones and grave markers and so on are legally protected. But if you don't have a headstone, you're not buried in a cemetery. Well, that's, that's folly, right? Only a lawyer would believe that. 
right? Believe that there's a distinction there. No offense if you're an attorney, okay? Um, but, but that's, I mean, everybody would agree if that's a burial, it's a burial, right? Um, so Crestone is a legally protected, legally defined burial, and it's got a gate and all that kind of stuff. It just, and they've got maps on where people are so that you just don't go in and dig somebody else up to put somebody else in, but it's 4,000 acres. It's a massive, massive facility. Um, and it has become a, a really, I don't want to say really important, it has become important for several reburials in Colorado. And again, one of the most problematic aspects, you do all the right stuff. And then you get to a point where you can't find a place to, to rebury some ancestors. How tragic is that? It's unbelievable. Really? That's, that's, that's where we're at. And yeah, but you've got to find a place that's acceptable to the tribal nations. It's acceptable to their cultural context, which may be divergent, their interests and so on. But Crestone was where we found some success. Uh, so my question would be, NAGPRA is 30 years old now, 32 mm -hmm. years old, mm -hmm. actually. Do we need new legislation? Um, you, you, you were commenting on the fact that, you know, there, there are problems with it. Um, would it benefit us to revisit that, you know, now that we've moved into, you know, we've been through 30 plus years. I smile because I'm about to say something that I haven't said in 18 years. And that's, that's a discussion we should have over a drink, right? Um, it's not, the question was about, should we rewrite NAGPRA and try and redo it? I don't think a new law would get passed under any set of circumstances right now. I think NAGPRA is a useful compromise. It was achieved with over two decades worth of compromise. I would implore us as ethically grounded uh, curators and scientists and so on to just go above the, go beyond the law and see what we can do. Um, but it's, we're, we're a society of laws and I understand that and that's a good thing. Um, but just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's right. And I think, you know, finally the society for American archeology span and I just got off the board so I can speak about it. Um, you know, our archeological colleagues, when, when a statement came out on, on that, on, um, NAGPRA not too long ago, it sounded like nothing had changed in a generation and things have changed in a generation. Um, but we were afraid science was going to end as we know it and all that kind of stuff. It patently hasn't happened. Um, there were shrill voices on all sides. There still are to some degree, um, but we're doing a much better job of it. And yet 32 years on and what, 35% of the ancestors, there's still 120,000 sets of Native American ancestors in museums in the absence of informed consent. It's hard to argue that the law has been successful seen in that light. One more, okay. <laughs> and that I'm done. I'm not even going to bring that up. The question was about Kennewick man. That's for you all up here in the Northwest. I'm not saying a thing about Kennewick man. <laughs> Thanks for the setup, by the way. That, sorry, Mark. Yeah, the, um, um, in the news recently that the sarcophagus of the sarcophagus that was found in the Notre Dame believed to be believed to be from the 14th uh, 14th century. Mm -hmm. And they said they're hoping that the mystery will be revealed soon mm -hmm. as to what it was. Um, I don't know how they plan to reveal the mystery, mm -hmm. whether they plan to open it or not. Um, is it the correct thing to do? Uh, oh, so the question for Zoom folks, it's under Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. A sarcophagus was re recently found, not an Egyptian sarcophagus, it was clearly a 14th century European thing. I would talk to the source community. I would talk to the French and say, is it ethical? And if they say, cool, great. I mean, the Egyptians are totally fine with research going on on their ancestors. It is a source community issue that we stick with. Scientifically, I would love to know more about it, but there's more to this world than science with a capital S. Um, we've, we've sort of used up our chits, right? We've got these museums that are full of stuff and yet we keep digging. Eh, not so good. One question over here. Um, I was wondering if part of the problem with still having so many human remains in museums um, is uh, do the tribes have difficulty claiming these bodies? Is there some reason that we aren't seeing more of them being repatriated? Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, so the question for Zoom was um, one of the reasons why there's so many ancestors still in museums that some of the tribal nations are having difficulty making those claims. It, it's an incredibly arduous process to make a legally standing NAGPRA claim. And many of these tribal nations don't have the, they've got other priorities. Um, and, and it's not to say that their ancestors aren't priorities, but it takes a lot of time and money and, you know, spiritual power and, and work. I mean, it's, again, I've been in collections work for a long time and I've seen people visibly shaken by the experience of going into museum collections. And 
for me, that's not the reaction I typically get. But again, let's turn the lens right back on myself or um, or somebody else, and and let's put yourself into a situation where something that's incredibly meaningful to you is taken out of its cultural context by some people who aren't your own and put someplace that it's not supposed to be. People fight wars over that, right? So it's incredibly hard work to do for museums. It's that much harder for tribal nations to engage in it. So yeah, you're absolutely right, and that's why it's an unfunded mandate, right? There's not the tribes aren't getting much money to do this. Well, that was another question I had was expense of it, but is there some way to help the tribes um, besides monetarily to come to terms with that? I, because I know they want them to pay yeah. yep. yep. And I and I can't speak for the tribal nations myself, but I, I can say that you know at, at my museum we've been doing what we can to to um, make the path as um, less challenging as possible, but it's always challenging. It's really hard work. It really is. All right. Two more, and then we're going to call it, I think. Mark, sorry. Yeah, just by, for the clarification for, 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 for um, understanding better, is there a, a distinction for um, how human remains for paleo Indians, the type that you were talking about? Mm -hmm. Can I make man that the archetype go beyond the ancient time where tribe, individual tribes could say maybe who are descended from, um, depending on where it's found? Um, and um, and how that's being handled, and our our DNA testing required uh, because I I know um, I know a lot of uh, uh, East Coast Atlantic Mid Atlantic tribes considered even taking their own DNA or DNA of their ancestors. Yeah. Again, uh, uh, robbing each other. Yeah. How's that work? So with regard to and a friend of mine uses the term Paleo American because. Indian didn't mean anything until Columbus made his mistake, right? So Paleo-American, um, the question was if there's um, uh, is sort of a time limit, I guess, or you know, how do you do cultural affiliation with uh, you know, an ancestor who's 15,000 years old? Um, it's a great question, but for me, the starting point is, well, it's not my ancestor, we know that. Um, and it's not anybody at my museum's ancestor. Um, now, as a scientist, I sure as heck can say that it would be great to, uh, to learn more about those folks back in deep time, but we've got to do it collaborative, collaboratively with the tribal nations. And Zuni language, glottochronology, that's a, been an isolate for 7,000 years. That's a long time, folks. Um, so I don't, there's no cutoff that I know of. There's some folks have implemented a cutoff like that, um, but it's it would be arbitrary and it would be, you know, anyway, you got to talk to the source communities themselves. And then as far as DNA analysis goes, case by case basis, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, we asked whether or not the tribal nations wanted us to do DNA analysis on the WS Ranch ancestors and they said no. And totally fine, all right, that's, that's not, I'm not gonna get upset about that. So one more here and then we gotta get you all home. Yeah. Well, thank you first for an excellent talk. Sure. Um, it was just a kind of clarification numbers. You mentioned 120,000. Is that just in the museums? Is that just in the registry? Because in my mind, there's probably quite a bit in like not just museums, but yeah. the university stores and stuff yeah. like that. That is it just what's known that's from yeah. the registry? And, and the, that number is not even accurate. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it when the Smithsonian started this work and they had 120,000 sets by themselves, represented individuals by themselves. Field 12,000 sets, orders of magnitude smaller, still a big problem, but not on yeah. the level of the Smithsonian. So I shouldn't have even quoted numbers, but it's in the hundreds of thousands. And you're absolutely right. We don't know the, the, the actual numbers. And this is where the tragedy continues is that there keeps on being discoveries of ancestors and people's teaching collections and so on. Again, I totally understand that we can learn from the study of human remains, but we cannot do it and be engaged in discrimination in the process. And that's what the word is. When it's Native American ancestors in the museum and nobody else, that's called discrimination. And we don't discriminate. We're not supposed to discriminate in our society. All right, gang, thank you so much for your time and attention. This was fun. Thank you very much. Before we go, we do have the, uh, well, um, we're back here live again. And uh, for those of you who have joined us live, we are reinitiating our book uh, raffle. We have three books with us this evening.